Welcome to Chapter 8 of Matrix Games World in Flames training video. This chapter covers air missions and air combat. To get started, why don't we look at the main form and we'll see that it's July and August 1941, it's Axis First Impulse, and it's the ground strike phase with the uh, subphase of the attacker as the fly to the target. So what we're doing are ground strikes. I'm going to double click on this and give you a sense of where we are in the in the game. We're in the air phases. We've already done strategic and carpet bombing. We're about to do ground strikes. I've already bypassed combat air patrol. And what this chapter covers are the subphases one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them, all the way down to uh, returning the air units back to base. So we send them out, they get intercepted by the defender. The attacker gets the opportunity to intercept the interceptors. Air-to-air -air combat, then anti-aircraft fire by the defender. The mission is performed, in this case the mission is a ground strike. And the attacker returns his air units to base and the defender returns his. That's what we're going to cover in this chapter. The scenario that we are playing here is Barbarossa. We're in the second turn, that's July-August. The first turn was uh, May-June. And we're in the first impulse. The weather for this is fine throughout the northern part of uh, the map, which in this case is uh, Russia and Poland, which is where we're having the combat. Uh, give you another look at the weather here. It's fine everywhere except in the north monsoon, and this scenario only covers the uh, German invasion of Russia, so we're not concerned with that. And we also look at the next turn, the next time the weather is rolled, we have a 100% chance of getting fine weather in the Arctic and the North Temperate. And if you look here, you'll see the AR is Arctic area. And it's Arctic almost everywhere until you get down into the Ukraine. And the Ukraine has a, a North Temperate portion of it. So the battlefield that we're looking at here is primarily Arctic with some North Temperate weather in the south. But what we're going to have is fine weather throughout uh, the f first and second impulses and also the third and fourth impulses. Let's take a look at the battlefield overall. Uh, look at the northern front and this goes from Murmansk all the way down to Leningrad and the flags will show you that the USSR holds most of this but individual Finnish soldiers have made little forays here and converted some of the hexes into German flags. That was to cut this rail line going up to Murmansk and now this unit, the ski unit, is wending its way south. There was another uh, Finnish unit that started somewhere up in here and has come on a path down this far and has managed to cut the rail line down here. We'll take a look at an overview of the southern portion of the battlefield and this is the Odessa, still held by the Russians. This is the Dnieper River, which is an important defensive line. Kiev is still held by the Russians, but it's on the wrong side of the Dnieper. Historically, that was a problem, too. There's a hole in the line here where the Germans are going to be able to pass over the Dnieper and, and break the, uh, the river line. There's another hole up here in the north uh, where the Finn and the uh, Germans are about to link up. Russia still holds these hexes. They haven't been traversed by the Germans, but that's a hold nonetheless. Do a little closer here. We'll look at the army group north, and you'll see that the Russians just have a few scattered units. The Finns are holding them off here. And uh, I'll bring up what the flyouts get to show us. There's 11 units in this hex. The other two are submarines. So the only defenders are these eight points of uh, land units. If you look up at the top, up in this area, when I center on Leningrad, you'll see that there are eight attack points, but there are 16 defensive, and that's because Leningrad is in a swamp. There's also information up there that tells you it has two factories, which will help out on defense uh, under certain optional rules. The Finns on the other side have uh, 11 strength points, both attack and defense, but the uh, Russians are unlikely to go after them. 
there's sort of a standoff over here but the only reserve unit that the Russians have in this area is the 2-4 CAV the Germans on the other hand have the 6-4 infantry which can come across and they also have an awful lot of strength down in here the, the two units here are seven strength points again you can use this uh, table up at the top to see how strong each one of the hexes are I'm going to zoom in to six and just run down this line so there are seven points here the Germans have 15 in this hex they have 20 in that hex the other hexes for the Germans are 17 16 16 opposing them the Russians have 10 sort of they brought the line back so it's behind this river they also have another 17 here that's in a city that's in Smolensk again this information is up at the top if you ever want to uh, have a better understanding it's a clear hex here's a lot of strength points for the Russians 19 protected by the river uh, this hex is 14 and they also have uh, 13 down here there's a nice river line here that they're making use of uh, they have one unit in reserve which is the headquarters down here they have uh, 17 strength points and in Kiev they have 12 and back of the line again this is kind of uh, pulled back is uh, another 17 these are just air units back out here except for the uh, Kharkov militia which just arrived and 15 here 11 here and 15 here so the defensive hexes for the Russians are pretty strong the trouble is there's gaps in the line uh, the Germans on the other hand have 11 they've got another infantry unit here they've got another mountain unit here they have a very nice 17 tack points here and so on so you can go down the line and see all the units it's a couple more units coming up and as you can tell the Germans have plenty of pl uh, planes in reserve and they have some more infantry units coming up a couple of mountain units the attack on Odessa there's five points defending and there are nine plus four for 13 this guy's coming across the river so he's going to be halved so that'll make 15 on five so it's a three to one attack on Odessa that's not very attractive well we're looking at ground strikes and the ground strikes are, should be in support of the land operations so first off one of the ground strikes I'm going to do is to take this artillery unit and have it quote unquote ground strike uh, the units in Kiev uh, because it's an artillery unit using its bombardment capability during ground strike uh, it cannot be interfered with by any of these fighters over here whereas if the planes fly a ground strike then it can be interfered by the fighters the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this bomber which has a tactical of four and I'm going to fly it up to uh, this hex which has three Russian units in it and I'll try to ground strike them so it's going to be a 40 percent chance of disrupting each of these units so the chances of me missing them all are uh, pretty low but the chances of me getting them all is even lower on the other hand the artillery unit bombarding this hex is going to get a 60 percent chance to disrupt each of these three units the other attack that I want to do in terms of ground strikes is going to be on the center point of the uh, Russian line there's an armor and a mechanized up here and if I can disrupt them it's going to cut down on the ability of the Russian player to rearrange his units I don't necessarily want to attack them I just want to stop them from moving for the rest of the turn unless the headquarters or somebody else reorganizes them and if that happens then the headquarters is going to be disrupted and not able to move so I'm trying to pin the line here the units I have available for doing the ground strike are in the selectable units list over here and there's a lot of them there are the artillery units and by clicking to the right of this the map centers on this unit and this unit happens to be right here likewise if I go and right click to this unit the map centers on that and I can find any of these units 
and they're all capable of doing ground strikes. The problem is that I only have four air missions available. What's happened is Germany has taken a land action which gives it four air missions, none of which have been used so far. It has three rail moves. It can do unlimited land moves and land attacks. So we have to use these four air missions carefully and each time we fly a bomber during ground strike it's going to use up one of those. So I'm only going to fly two bombers. I'm going to let an artillery unit do the third ground strike. So let's do that first. You just go to the artillery unit, you click on it, you move it to the hex, and it is now doing a ground strike. I'm going to take this unit and have it attack here. And I want it to fly with an escort. I'm going to take the uh, BF-109. It has a range of three, so it can reach that hex. It would not be able to fly as an interceptor. That's too far away. The Hungarian could theoretically fly as an interceptor, but I want to save the Hungarian because he has two tactical points, which I might want to use. So I'm going to fly the fighter up here as an escort. So in this hex now, there are three Russian units and the tactical bomber with its escort. And the last, I'm going to take this tactical bomber and I'm going to fly it to here to do that ground strike. It has a 50% chance on each of those three units. If the Russians send a fighter against this, I've got two fighters who can fly as interceptors. This guy's a little bit too far. He would have to be within the range of two in order to intercept the interceptors. He could fly as an escort, but I'd rather keep him for right now. So I'm flying just the uh, three planes. And if you go over here, you can see that the little red dot means that one, two, three planes are flying and also the artillery has been committed. And that's it for bombers and escorts subphase. The flag advances to defensive interceptors and the Russian player now gets four units that he can select for interceptors. Again, if I click on to the right of this unit, it's going to show me where that unit is. And in fact, I could pick it up and move it as an interceptor, or I could pick it up from here, which is what I'm going to do. I'll pick it up from here and fly it as an interceptor. And you'll notice that it was the same as picking it up from the map and moving it there. I could also fly other planes. These two are within three, which is half the range. If they're intercepting, they get half the range three. So they're within three, they could intercept. And I also have up here in the north, I have another Yak-1, which could reach it, but I want to keep that one for now. So that's it for defensive interceptions. We now go on to the next subphase of ground strikes, which is the attacker intercepts the defensive interceptors. And these two units are shown in the selectable units list. They can go and fly here. I'm going to take the, uh, the sky and I'll have him fly as an interceptor and I'm done. And I just click on end of phase. And now we're into the air to air combat. I get to actually choose the die rolls here, which I'm doing because I want to know what happens. So I'll choose a 13 as a die roll here. And it says the USSR clears one of the Axis bombers. Now, there's only one bomber, so guess which one gets cleared? Now, that's the USSR attacking the Germans. Now, the Germans get to attack the USSR. For this, I'm going to use a die roll of 12. And the Germany clears one of the Allied bombers. Now, there are no Allied bombers, so nobody gets cleared. Let me go over this form. The form shows the combat down in the insert map. It shows the units that are competing. And in this case, there are two fighters. Originally, there had been a bomber, this bomber down here, which has been cleared through. The air-to-air -air combat is done between the fighters. So it's between the 
VF 109E3 and the I-17. The air-to-air -air strength here is 4, here is 6, the difference is 2, and that's shown down here. When the axis rolls its die, it's going to be a plus 2. When the ally does its counter roll, it's going to be a minus 2. That's what happened the last time. The die roll was a plus 2, and the result was attacker clears, and what the uh, Russians cleared was the German bomber. When the Allied side, the Russians, rolled back, they rolled a 13. The odds at minus 2, that table means that it's also an attacker clears. So there are no Russian planes to be cleared. So nothing effectively happened there. We're now into the second round of combat, and we're about to choose whether to stay or not. German player would like to stay and shoot down the I-17. So he says yes. Now the USSR gets a chance to decide whether they want to stay or whether they want to retreat. For the USSR, fighters are very valuable and there's no reason to risk them just in a head-to-head -head combat, especially when your odds are minus two. So he's just going to abort from this combat, which terminates the combat. But first, we get a digression, which is for this plane to return to base because it aborted. So we pick up one, two, three, four, back to here. So the Russian has returned to base. Now the program shows you that this was the final and lets you review the results. And you click on OK Done. And now we're into the anti-aircraft phase. What's happened is We've done the air-to-air -air combat. We're now into defensive anti-aircraft phase, and there are three parts to this. First, the defensive player, which is the Russian, chooses which aircraft guns he wants to fire and who he wants to fire them at. Once he's done that for all his anti-aircraft units, and you can see the two of them up here that he has to choose from, once he's done that for all his anti-aircraft units, he can then plot the results of that fire on the individual planes. So first you decide which units to shoot and at what, and then the second is the die rolls which then result in the damage. And again the USSR player is going to get to assign the damage. So we're in this part, defensive anti-aircraft fire. And this unit is right here and he could fire at the bomber that's uh, ground striking him. However, if he does that the anti-aircraft unit is going to become disrupted, which makes it more vulnerable to attack. So for right now, the Russian player is just going to grit his teeth and say no. But the heavy anti-aircraft gun is here, and he could fire on this bomber. And he's going to do that, because what he really doesn't want to have happen is he doesn't want to have both this hex and this hex with a couple disrupted units on it. So we select here and we only have one hex that we can fire at. The other hex is the artillery which uh, doesn't receive any aircraft fire. So we just click on that hex and now we could use one of our four shots. In reality we're going to use all four of them because we only have one target. When you use one shot you're going to get three anti-aircraft factors delivered. That's because this is a 3-2. Three the three is what's happening here. When we use the second shot, we've now used six. When we use all of them, we get all 12 have now been applied. And we have no more to use. So we just click OK. And since we do not want to use the light anti-aircraft gun, we're going to click Done with the phase. So the result here is that the USSR has one damage point to deliver. He's getting the lowest of five die rolls with his 12, and the lowest of his five die rolls happen to be a one. So he's not going to have very much that he can do here. The bomber is coming in with a tactical of four. When he applies the reduction here, the bomber has a one point reduction. It now is going to come in with a three. So instead of a 40% chance of disrupting each of the three units, he's going to have a 30% chance. If you do better on your die rolls, you can 
end up aborting the bomber or even potentially destroying it, though it's very difficult to destroy bombers with anti-aircraft guns. So here's the ground strike. This is the Stuka that's attacking. It's the Stuka that's attacking here. And I have turned on show die rolls so I get a dramatic presentation of the fact that the Stuka needed a five to disrupt this unit and it rolled a seven. Cheers from the Russian player. The second unit that he rolls against, he rolls a four, so the armor is going to be disrupted. And here, attacking the anti-aircraft gun, the nine is useless. So the result here is that the mechanized is still organized, the armor is disorganized, and the anti-tank is still organized. If you do not want to go through and watch each die roll one by one, the summary page presents the same information for you. Here's the uh, JU-88A coming in. He needed a 3 and he rolled a 10. He rolled a 7 and he rolled a 9. So he was totally ineffective. Did not disorganize any of those units. Here is the railgun firing on Kiev, and the 6 is good. And with a 2, it's also good on this unit. And on a 3, it's good on this unit. So he's actually disorganized. And you can see by the little uh, status indicators that they all have their little orange dot indicating you know, hot, wet tears. What we've done is we've done sending out the bombers, the interceptors, the attacker interceptors, did the air-to-air -air combat. We went through the three subphases of anti-aircraft fire. We just performed the mission, which the ground strikes, and now we're going to return units to base. The selectable units form up here on the left show all the units that have to return to base. You might notice that the end of phase button is disabled. You have to return all these units before this will become enabled. So we can just pick up this guy. Well, let's see where he is first. Pick him up, move him over here. The Stuke is here. We'd like to have him in the closer to the front line. This fighter was pretty good where he was originally, so we'll move him there. And we'll bring this guy again towards the front. Now that we've moved all of these, we get the button and we can click end of phase. And we've now gone on to rail movement. Just to go back and review what's happened, the anti-aircraft gun here fired, so it's now disorganized. These units survived their attack without any of them becoming disorganized. These were hit, th all three of them, so the defense of Kiev is in serious jeopardy here. And up here in the north, one of these units was disorganized and the Russians lost one of their fighters for the rest of the turn unless they reorganize it. And that concludes Chapter 8 of the training video on air movement and air combat.